All right. Hey, everybody. This is Heavy Art Talk. I have here Adam Burke, also known as Nightjar Illustrations. Uh, just a little bio about Adam. Basically, he's a musician and an artist, uh, primarily a painter from what I can tell. And he's been basically a professional since 2010. And um, some of the bands that he's in uh, include Fellwoods, Jetpack, The Pills. And then in terms of the bands he's worked with, I mean, his art is very signature. You kind of know, like, when you have an album, like, it has his style all over it. And, I mean, it's a ton of bands, uh, a lot in the metal sphere. But just a couple that, you know, come out to me would be, like, Gate Creeper, Hath, Avokin, Chornabog. Got that in the background there. Hooded Menace. He's done a couple covers for Fit for an Autopsy, Signs of the Swarm, Coffin Mulch, Angel Witch, Unto Others, Megaton Sword, Unleash the Archers, Chelsea Grin, and that's just even just scratching the surface. But yeah, Adam, how's uh, your week been? Uh, pretty good. It's been a busy one. I'm, uh, I'm kind of buried in commissions once again, and... Uh, that's a good thing, but it usually means that uh, I have to really, you know, kind of hit it hard to, to uh, uh, you know, try to deliver in a in a timely fashion. So, yeah, busy, but but pretty good. Yeah. So, how many hours do you think you're painting every day then? At least uh, the last week. <laughs> I, you know, that is almost entirely dependent on my uh, familial duties. <laughs> uh, um, once everyone starts getting hungry, I have to drop what I'm doing and go make food. But, uh, um, I try to treat it like a job. You know, I, if I, I'll, I'll start painting, I don't know, anywhere from seven to eight in the morning and go till like four or five, you know, when I got to kind of start making dinner. Occasionally I'll, I'll come back in the evening if I have any, uh, juice left, but, Honestly, I, I have a three-year-old right now, and, and he tends to occupy all of my remaining energy. So, <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. I don't have any kids myself, but, I mean, you have a, a few, right? Yeah, I have two two older kids, a daughter who's in her uh, first year of college, and a 17-year-old boy who's uh, he's got one more year of high school, and then my, my three-year-old little dude. Very cool. At my hands full. Yeah, it's almost like you've kind of had this pattern over time, and now you're back with like a really young kid. I imagine that's like it's almost like you remember maybe what it was like, you know, 17, 18 years ago when you had, you know, your first. That was you know that age. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's remarkable how much I don't remember. I think there's a a thing that nature does to dads in particular where they. It, it's kind of like a partial lobotomy when you have you know, <laughs> kids. So um, I didn't quite remember what I was in for, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're back but, in it. Yeah. But there is, you know, like, I think I'm a better parent now than I was back then just cause I, I have a little more life experience and stuff. So there's a, there's some, some, some of the old lessons definitely come into play. Yeah. And, and I had a note here that, you're from Portland primarily, but are you a little more out in like the woods now? I, I'm just trying to capture like where uh, you are kind of like um, landscape wise currently. Cause I imagine you're not in the city anymore. I think I saw that maybe on your Instagram. Uh, no, I, I am still in the city. I'm, I'm oh, okay. a little further out, you know what? Um, I guess it now would be considered not terribly far out, but uh um, you know, it's kind of like the, it was the burbs of the of the sixties um, out in East Portland. Okay. Um, but no, I, I'm I'm kind of stuck in the city at the moment. Um, we are probably as soon as as my older son uh, flies the flies the coop, we're gonna head out rural somewhere. So uh, and and that's been I've been trying to do that for like fifteen years. So that'll be great. Yeah. And do you enjoy like hiking and camping or any particular like outdoor activities you enjoy the most? Oh yeah. Um, camping, uh, fly fishing. I'm, those are kind of lifelong loves and yeah, I mean, hiking, backpacking. Um, I mean, I, we live in a place where we don't have to go terribly far to, 
to find all kinds of good stuff. So, um, yeah, outdoor stuff is really kind of my, that's, that's my life lifetime love. Yeah. And, uh, I was reading like an interview I think you did in like 2016. I'm trying to remember the publication. I, is it unquiet ones or unquiet things? <laughs> I, I saw it online when I was just doing some quick research, but it was talking about how you always can be inspired by nature basically, because there's always mm -hmm. so much more to learn. And then that fuels a lot of like, at least the foundation for your art. And then from there, it's like where your imagination kind of takes over. And I thought that was really cool. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that that's, that's still, uh, you know, I'm very much kind of at the heart of where my, I don't know, just the real inner nerdy part of my brain. It's, it's nature stuff. So yeah, it's infinitely inspirational. You can never, never learn it all, never see it all. Yeah. Any particular like subjects or things that you're like reading into like at the moment um you know i've i've been a, you know kind of a plant nerd for a long time so that's that's a pretty rich world to to draw inspiration from and i you know i i do a lot of gardening and stuff too so i i bring a lot of that i use a lot of native plants in my gardening i i was actually a landscaper before i started painting more seriously so um i have a lot of gardening background and yeah plants play play into it quite a bit um geology is is always fascinating i mean you know it's all around us and we're part of it and um you know i like to go out rock hounding and finding cool stuff in the in the woods and the canyons and stuff so yeah, I'd say those are two two of the big ones. Neat. Yeah, my uh, my dad's a geologist. He does mostly like studying groundwater, but like that was something I kind of grew up with a little bit. And then I took some courses in college, mostly because I just knew I could like call him up if I ever had any <laughs> questions. So right. that was pretty nice. Yeah. I forget a lot of it now because um, I've been out of college for a minute, but I, I did enjoy that course because it got you thinking a little bit more about the earth. I, I went to like business school. So I was thinking a lot about, I don't know, the more tangible stuff and, and, and like just learning kind of like the scale of time, I think was very interesting to me and yeah. being able to study like the layers of rocks to be able to determine how old something is like, that's yeah. what like archeologists might use. I thought that was cool. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. It really kind of puts thing in, things in perspective. I mean, you know, it's funny, Oregon's geology is not super ancient as compared to like the East Coast, but it's it's kind of cool because it's very present. You know, we have we have volcanoes and we have uh, this mm -hmm. big ocean that uh, is always exposing new stuff. And um, yeah, it's it's pretty, pretty awe inspiring. So just kind of where did your you know, passion for art really began? Like, were you drawing a lot as a kid or did it kind of come a little later in life? Um, yeah, I was, I, drawing was kind of my main, um, main pastime if I was, you know, just either playing outside or, or drawing. Um, you know, my family was not, we didn't have a lot of television, um, and <laughs> fancy toys. So my, uh, and, you know, I grew up in, in rural Oregon, so um, the parents would just be like, get out of the house and, you know, you, you'll, get a, you'll get a whistle at dinner time. <laughs> Old school. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but, yeah, drawing, uh, that's as far back as I can remember. Um, I, ne I never really, I, you know, I would occasionally try and paint, but I always kind of I didn't really understand it and felt that drawing was my more kind of safe zone. For but sure. Did that my whole life. Um, I actually went to, I, I actually went to school for architecture at first um, at the university of Idaho and kind of quickly switched majors to fine art. And I was doing uh, sculpture kind of like modern conceptual stuff. 
um, and then I got sidetracked playing music and that and dropped out of school and <laughs> <I just laughs> played in bands for for years and then yeah that's kind of where I picked up the art again was just trying to make make art for my own bands yeah I think I recall in that that interview is saying that you did a painting for the Fellwoods album cover and then <laughs> people would ask you like you know perhaps like who did that cover it's like oh me and then you basically kind of got commissions from theirs. Is that about right? Yep, yep, yep. I, um, you know, that band was kind of, um, you know, kind of proggy, heavy '70s stuff with, with some kind of proto metal flavor, um, and you know, fantasy art really just kind of fit the vibe. So uh, I was like, oh, I'm gonna try doing some of this swords and sorcery stuff. I mean that stuff was kind of forbidden fruit for me as a kid. My yeah. family was real religious and I've always, I mean, you know, like a Frazetta painting when I was a kid was just like, awe. you know, it was kind of like terror and awe inspired. <laughs> yeah. Forbidden all the, you know, naked ladies and everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they're just violent. And so, you know, they're kind of like shocking images if you're, you know for a kid anyway um so it felt really fun to do that to kind of delve into that style as an adult because it just felt like oh well i get to indulge in all this stuff i didn't get to and yeah it just kind of you know there was uh that was kind of in that uh you know 2010s uh doom everyone had a doom band right and, um, you know, a lot of more kind of throwback metal and stuff. And, um, so I think I just kind of started doing that at just the right time. Cause a lot of bands wanted more fantasy kind of art. So that was be that'd be like 2010s, like in Portland, like what were maybe some other bands that you were playing with at the time or like, you know, so there was the Felwoods who else would be on the bill, you know, in the scene. Yeah. Let's see. Um, Oh, you know, the first one who springs to my mind is Donova. Um, you know, they're still going. But they they were kind of the, the kings of the scene as far as uh, shreddy 70s stuff goes. And they're still completely untouchable. Um, uh, who else? Uh, <laughs> see, this is where the parental lobotomy is going to strike. Um Oh, we played with this band Holy Grove a few times. They were they're pretty great, you know, heavy kind of stonery doom stuff. Um, I think if we had, oh, one of our favorite bands to play with was this band Crag Dweller. Um, great name. Yeah, yeah, they were <laughs> they were so good. Um, they were just and and they were you know phenomenal musicians too. Um, I ended up starting a band with their drummer later on um, as both of our bands kind of evaporated, but uh, they were, they were super cool. Um, kind of mining some of the same waters as us, you know, heavy seventies stuff. Um, yeah. I don't know. They, I mean, there really were like a zillion, I would say like somewhere around 2012 into 2014, there were like a zillion metal bands in Portland. I mean, it was really a, kind of a hot moment to be in a underground metal band here at least from the outside looking in i mean it still appears that way do you do you not really agree though or it's just different oh, i i agree i mean partially i've withdrawn from um you know my my latest band kind of fizzled out with the pandemic yeah and um yeah i'm just kind of getting to a, a point in life where I, I don't quite have the the interest or energy to 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 go to shows as much and stuff. So, um, and, and you know, I would say, especially emerging from the pandemic, the, the scene has really kind of picked up again and, and that's super good to see. Um, but Portland as a whole it, it culturally, and, you know, I might just be old and clueless. So, uh, you know, any younger Portlanders who are absolutely <laughs> loving angry right comments now, all around. Yeah, they can, <laughs> Feel free to set me straight. I would actually love to be set straight on this, but um, Portland has passed its prime in a lot of ways, at least from my perspective. I mean, it's still, 
has a ton of cool people living here, but it, it's just kind of, you know, it kind of, it seemed like it had a little bit of its moment in the sun, um, where a ton of people moved here and that felt pretty weird for me as a i'm you know almost a lifetime oregonian so to have portland be like a desirable place to live was strange yeah um but it, that influx actually made it even cooler for a minute there it was just like exciting to be here but you know following that you got all the kind of late late comers and and culture vul vultures start trying to get a piece of it and that expensive rent yep that big that big you know gentrification and and um the you know people who just didn't really get what made it special trying to get a piece of it really kind of i don't know it, it was like this perfect storm between portland you know doubling down on its uh you know sort of <sighs> young vital um sort kind of, of progressive eclectic. yeah yeah like that clashing with the sort of yuppification it just like whew, i don't know it, it seems like it really took the steam out of the city for, for me anyway yeah no i could definitely see that so I, I live in atlanta and similar kind of things happen here you mm -hmm. know and atlanta's become a pretty desirable place to live mm -hmm. uh, for some people as well and um it's almost like you look back at the 96 Olympics and kind of where it's gone from there. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, I remember seeing Seattle kind of go through this same thing. In fact, when I moved to, to Portland with my band in the, in the late nineties, Portland wasn't cool at all. Um, but Seattle was very cool, but I think Seattle was about to become not cool. <laughs> well, you had the grunge and then, yeah, I guess that it, the same thing happened. It, yeah. Hit that that peak and where else yeah. do you go yeah and i mean it, i'm sorry to all the rad bands that are still eking out in existence in the yuppie desolation of seattle but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no i i love playing up there we have like a lot of good friends and stuff and there's some killer bands up there but i think it's that city has i mean san francisco's gone through the same thing i mean they're I think Oakland's probably going to go through the same thing. It's just that that pattern yeah. it seems to repeat itself. I feel you there. If I may, kind of going back to uh, your childhood then, you know, we're still talking about music. So if you had like a religious upbringing, were you kind of sheltered from, you know, rock music or were <laughs> they pretty open to that? Oh, no. Very sheltered. Yeah. Um, you know, I, but I was... I was really into music from a pretty young age, but you know, it was mostly kind of pop music. You know, I remember just like eighties pop then. Yeah. I remember being super into that kind of late era Genesis. I loved, <laughs> I loved Phil Collins. Yeah. Um, who else? Oh, Bon Jovi heart, but you know, sort of like the kind of like just starting to go into the, that glam rock period. Um, but it was, it was very poppy, mainstream, hard rock, super into Van Halen. Uh, and then in, in high school got more into, uh, you know, just a little heavier music and a lot of real shreddy, <laughs> but still very, you know, kind of cheesy butt rock stuff. Um, but my parents, I mean, my brother and I had to hide uh, album covers. I remember, you know, we both were super into Faith No More. And we were like, if our parents even see that name in their house, they're going to oh, die. Yeah. They're, they're just going to kill us. So, um, yeah, heavy music, metal in particular, for me was, I kind of had this funny line because I was a real goody two-shoes where I was like, I like it, you know, hard and fast and cool, but sometimes it's actually scary. Sometimes it's so heavy, it's evil. And it, and it kind of was like, Ooh, I kind of like it, but I, I'm a little bit intimidated by this. Yeah. I can relate. Yeah. That's, but it draws I, you back for some reason. Yep. You know, yep. Yeah. yeah. I remember, uh, in like middle school, um, 
So, you know, I, I'm 31, so I'm a bit different generation. But, like, for me, like, I remember hearing, like, uh, Cradle Filth for the first time. And, you know, I'd, like, hide that from, like, my parents and stuff. <laughs> and, like, that, you know, scared the shit out of me. And yeah. then, you know, it became more, um, you know, bands like Morbid Angel, like, God of Emptiness and stuff. And, like, you know, yeah. I'm not really showing my parents that. I mean, they they <laughs> understood. And they they're just concerned about me. They're very good people. But yeah. I... um I definitely like wasn't just broadcasting it quite as much as maybe my other friends. I was similar to you and I was kind of like the, the goody two shoes, but of like the metal kids. So the metal kids want me around because their parents are like, Oh yeah, be more like Lee. Right. You yeah. know, yeah. So I could kind of relate to that in a bit. <laughs> yeah. So it seems like throughout life you've had um, art and music of interest, but it's almost like you'd be more focused on one at the moment and then you'd kind of flip flop. Did, did it kind of feel like that? Or do you feel like at any point in time you were like equally focused on both? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking back on it, it, it did kind of take on that pattern, you know, just, I think I, I've always had this need to, to create and um, for a good while music really, took on that role in my life i mean it was all i cared about mm -hmm. i got super into the the 90s garage punk scene and that's when i started playing music uh and, you know my my friends and i and a lot of the people i still know and love today were kind of came out of that scene and you know i don't think i'll ever be as excited about music as i was just learning how to play because i was you know i didn't have any background in music you know, kind of teaching myself to be a pretty crappy guitarist and uh, um, learning to sing. Um, yeah, that, I don't know. That was, there's something about playing music that's like nothing else. I mean, it's the collaboration with your bandmates. It's the, um, you know, the kind of full body experience of it. It's when you play in front of other people. I mean, it's nothing like it. Um and I guess during Fellwoods and even into my, my next band after that was called Pushy. Um, that was kind of when I started making art a lot more seriously. And they were both kind of hand in hand for a while there. But uh, Is that I like your mid to late 20s or, or like early 20s? Uh, no, this was... Uh, um, I had actually kind of been, I hadn't been playing music for a, a while uh, in my early 30s. And that's when I had my, my son and daughter. And I was just doing family stuff. I was building a house, um, you know, very occupied with with family life. Yeah. Um, but uh, some of that kind of fell apart. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, that's when I started playing music again because I just kind of reconnected with a lot of old friends and, um, you know, just realized how much I needed it in my life. And, um, and the kids were getting just old enough at that point that I could kind of make it work, too. So that that helped. Um, but that was that was my mid 30s, you know, coming back like Fellwoods. I, I must have been 34 when I started that band. Um, so. Yeah, and I, I had had a few years off playing music. Yeah, I bet at that time, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it's your life, but like, so I used to be in a band as well, and I haven't done, I focused more on visual art because I've kind of been somewhat similar to you where I kind of like focus entirely on one at a time. Mm -hmm. So when I was like drumming, I mean, I'm just scheduling casually, but I wasn't like trying to really improve, you know, a lot. Right. And, and now I'm focused mostly on visual art outside of, you know, just making ends meet with, with a kind of more regular job. But it's almost like I've almost ridden off, you know, getting back into it and mm. you're know, similar age to me. And you probably were thinking, oh, yeah, it, that part of me is done. <laughs> and then yeah. it just came right back. It's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and now I'm, you know, I'm kind of back in, I think the, the kind of because I do art for a living and it's you know kind of the 
I have to, I have to make that the the money to pay my mortgage by painting. Um, there's a little more of a. It's funny, art has become that thing that has made it so uh, it's just harder to play music. I, um, but it's it's kind of a blessing too because um, it does satisfy that that part of my brain that I think always needs some some uh, uh, stimulation just creating. Yeah. It, it's kind of crazy how like prolific you are, at least it appears that way. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you do so many covers and I imagine some of them are commissions, but I also see you, you know, do like original work and you're like, Hey, I'll license it for this amount. Mm -hmm. Like, can you talk a little bit about maybe like those two different approaches for, you know, basically making money in art? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, when I, when I first started, it was all commissions. Um, and it was super exciting just to have anyone willing to, to give me money to make a painting for them. Um, but you know, after a few years of that, you start, and I said yes to everything. I mean, I had a few sort of hard nose on subject matter or whatever, but, um, mostly just stuff that I consider <laughs> to be in poor taste or morally questionable. Mm -hmm. But, um, painted a lot of stuff that I, I would never have come up with and never um, have chosen to paint if it wasn't that I was trying to, you know, establish myself. Um, so, you know, commissions really ruled the roost for a long time, but it really kind of wears you down as a creative person to, to only be doing commissions. Um, and it's it's simply just you know because you're you're kind of doing other people's ideas um so uh i think when, when i started having enough momentum as an illustrator and enough work coming in i was able to stop taking commissions periodically and and just paint and um and you know for a long time i used to try to kind of have this like fine art side hustle um like getting into galleries and stuff yep yep i'm trying to be a little more um in that world of of you know paint as exploration not not so illustrative um you know not like most most of the the metal album covers tend to sort of like tell a tale or or you know they're very representational so you get all of them you know, you can read into them pretty easily. Yeah. And I, it was partially just trying to become a better painter. I just really wanted to kind of like do what some of the more, I don't know, um, you know, painters who are pushing the limits and, and really exploring what paint can do. But, um, but uh, you know, just, I think ha doing it for a living made that. So it was a little hard to, um, keep that side of my sorry my printer decided to wake up and make <laughs> goofy noises here uh, <laughs> um uh okay so yeah so anyway i would uh um i would just do a painting th that was like uh well, you know, this could still be an album cover, but it's a little more coming from my heart and, and my interests and um so, you know, that, that felt a lot better and then just, you know, offer it for license, um, mostly as a way to just keep, keep my job. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I even had, I had a time maybe a year ago where I tried to just stop taking commissions altogether, um, because I, I just found that other way of working so much more gratifying and it worked for about six months or so but um it just it didn't quite uh provide the the work stream that i needed to keep a roof over our heads so, yeah um so you know they both but it, it, it's funny though when i came back to to really taking on more commissions i i almost feel like a shift had occurred where more people were sensitive to what I do. So a lot of the commission requests tend to be more 
in my, you know, typical uh, subject matter or way of yeah. working, you know, people are coming to me for my art, not just like this guy can paint anything. I, I that makes a lot of sense. An alien spitting out swords to a mountain of witches, I, you know. <laughs> um, yeah. So. I, I feel you. I, it kind of reminds me of, um, so like tattooers are kind of similar in the sense that a lot of people come and then you don't have as much of a choice on what you do if you want to take the the project or the, the job. But, you know, tattooers often paint stuff and then they put it out there like I'll either do this or I'll sell the original and they just keep mm -hmm. producing. Mm -hmm. And that kind of like work ethic reminds me a little bit of what you're doing, too. It's like mm -hmm. this is what I want to do. So if I get more commissions like that, we both win. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's really neat. So like, I mean, I don't know all of your work, but I feel like uh, in the last couple of years, I've seen a little bit more like female figure pop up. Would that be like one example of something that maybe is a little bit more of what you were trying to do or am I kind of stretching here? Hmm. Uh, that, that might just be, coincidental yeah 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 um you know i think i feel like i've in my more kind of fine art end of of the work and my personal work uh, yeah i guess there are definitely more females so that you're you're probably noticing something that i didn't even notice <laughs> myself so i, I think was just thinking of that uh fit for an autopsy cover like that's maybe a bit different than some of the more landscape oriented stuff that you're doing like five or six years ago. But like I right. said, I don't know all your work nearly right. as well as you do. Well, that one was just their idea. So <laughs> yeah. Um, I, it's, I, I actually, I love working with Will. He's a, he's a super easy client and um, I don't know, but basically an ideal client. Um, Cause I think he appreciates what I do he usually has an idea, but lets me do my thing. And he's, yeah, I don't know. It's just never a struggle. <laughs> with Will. I mean, you've done what, three, four covers for them? Yeah, I think, I think three albums and then a few, you know, like singles and, and uh, maybe posters and stuff. I mean, he's, he's licensed a few of my works that were personal works and, and used them too. So, um, but the three albums were all commissions where, where they kind of had a concept. Yeah. They're, they're great paintings. And I, I think something that's interesting there too, is I've, I've noticed your work a little bit more on some other like death core covers. I imagine them doing it, maybe got some other people in, interested in your work that, mm -hmm. you know, wasn't maybe in the more underground metal um, that isn't death core. Like, I mean, you're still listening to metal a lot or you, <laughs> Just kind of work with metal bands. No. Yeah. Not, I've never been. I mean, when I listen to metal, I'm listening to Judas Priest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, I'm not that into extreme metal and, and a lot of the, uh, you know, more underground styles that have emerged more recently. Um, I mean, some of the, you know, some classic death metal I love. I, I love thrash. But, um, I, love just kind of classic metal um but my heart is really honestly more in kind of like uh, you know thin lizzy zz top realm if i'm listening to guitar rock um so yeah i, I didn't go after death metal it was just that <laughs> it, it came to me yeah that <laughs> that's a funny um and and i actually kind of like that because I think it's made it so that I'm not all that aware of the, um, you know, kind of the visual language of it. Totally. So it, I mean, I've become more so, but um, I just, you know, I'm just kind of painting what I'm painting and in my style and it happens to kind of fit and, um, you know, that, or, uh, you know, maybe newer bands have a little more, uh, desire to kind of stretch the boundaries of, of what death metal art or black metal art looks like. And I mean, I guess a lot of the bands are like that with their music too. So, um, yeah, but I don't feel like I play to a scene at all. It's definitely not on purpose. Yeah. 
I mean, even in metal, like your covers are all across all the sub genres. Mm -hmm. Like you got power metal for sure. You have obviously death metal, but then, um, I mean, really just any style, right. Mm -hmm. Um, which is very cool. And I think that comes down to you obviously not being too immersed in that scene. That's a really interesting Mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. So what, like, uh, do you have any bands or artists right now that, you know, you'll be playing while you paint or you do podcasts while you paint? What does that look like? Um, almost entirely, uh, soundtrack music and like, uh, ambient music. It's, you know, almost all instrumental. Um, I've just found that if the music is, first of all, if they're singing or, or their lyrics, I, I have to be just super immersed in my paintings to, to really get the kind of momentum that I need to really <laughs> do it my, at my best. Yeah. So um, having music that can, I can kind of, you know, it, it will actually kind of like, I don't know. I feel like it um, complements painting and my subject matter, um, but it doesn't draw me away from it. So uh, yeah, it's almost all instrumental music, which is kind of cool because I I was into that as a younger person and I've really delved, you know, much more into it lately. So that's been kind of a nice development. Nice. And and when you like start each day, do you do any like warm up sketches or anything, or you just go right to the painting typically? Yeah, I, yeah, you know, for a long time, one of my routines, if I was going to start a painting, would be to just get on the internet and and look at artists that I love or or look at art books, um, you know, really try to absorb what they're doing. And also just gather tons of reference photos um, for, you know, like, uh, okay, I need to paint uh, a hand in this position. Um, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll just be in front of a mirror. Yeah. You know, a, lot of, a lot of the hands in my paintings are my hands. Uh, but sometimes I'm just scouring the internet for some stock photo of a hand. Um, <laughs> I know that feeling. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Um, but I actually found that to be kind of a, a nice process to just be digesting visual input like that. Um, and, and it kind of like eased me into a painting a little more. I I felt like I was prepared. Um, but I, I find that I don't do that near as much anymore. Um, and it may be that I've just digested a lot more, (laughs) <laughs> reference in so I can kind of just go at it. I mean, I still use a lot of reference photos and look at other painters, but it's, it's not as hungry as I, I used to be for that visual input. Yeah. And that would make sense. You probably painted thousands of hands. Since then, <laughs> right. You know? right. right. I'm still not good at it, but better <laughs> hands, yeah. hands and feet. And of course faces, but, Oh boy. Yeah. Yeah. Portraiture. I, I used to try real hard and I still feel like that's a, like an area that I can come back to and try to achieve some, some understanding, but yeah, faces. Whew. What about, uh, land? Do you do a lot of landscape reference or have you gotten to the point where you can just kind of imagine certain scenes? Like, I mean, you've painted a lot of mountains, <laughs> you know, over your time right yeah um it's a bit of both um i i take a ton of photos when i'm out in the in the woods in the mountains so i have a, a lot of my own references and yeah i do a lot of you know <laughs> looking through pinterest for foggy mountain scenes and um but you know i don't i, I think it's oftentimes just to kind of establish a mood that I'm looking at those reference photos to get the lighting, um, you know, kind of see where the contrast really matters and stuff. And then I'm usually just kind of going for it after that. And one, one thing that, I mean, I love your paintings for many reasons, but like one particular attribute that I think is really awesome that, 
you know, isn't the style of a lot of people is your sense of like scale. Mm -hmm. So like you intentionally make one thing like a figure really tiny, then you feel how big the mountain is. Mm -hmm. Like, did you find that inspiration from like other artists or is this something that just kind of naturally found you and you just intuitively kind of knew that that would like make everything have such a bigger impact? I think it's a bit of both. I mean, I, I think a lot of the awe I get from nature comes from that sense of scale. Um, so I think I've always, I think because that's always kind of gotten me that um, I try to express it. But there's also, you know, like if I'm going to be painting a space scene, in my mind, the the thing that that the, you know, the singular characteristic of space is the vastness. And I mean, I always think that I can't even ever portray scale and space the way it would probably really feel if you're yeah. there. Really tiny. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. But, uh, but yeah, sometimes it's, um, yeah, I don't know, I guess a bit of both kind of pivoting a little bit. So you, you studied um, more like 3D art and sculpture in, in in college, but, you know, what were some of the other courses like that you were taking? Like, is that where you really started to learn some of the painting fundamentals or did you already kind of get into that a little bit before or after? No, that was, uh, um, I, I just sucked in my painting class. And I mean, I, there's a certain level of painting, if you've been drawing your whole life, I mean, painting really is just an extension of drawing, I think. Yeah, totally. And, and I mean, I think being, I think the skill is being a good drawer. Um, but, uh, painting definitely didn't stick at that point. Um, it was, it, it was, you know, trying to make that album art, you know, years and years later in my mid thirties where I, where I just, was like okay i've got to learn how to paint um and i just i did a time i mean i was extremely motivated and, and ravenous to you know kind of be, increase my skills it was such a such a driving force for me at that point and i kind of went all in on it um and somewhere kind of because of this along the lines i, I went back to an art school here in portland um PNCA and I I was kind of it was kind of a like okay I need this to be a career yeah. so um you know I figured I'd go back to school and either acquire more skills or get enough get immersed in the world enough that it would lead to you know I could be a gallery curator or a teacher or you know it's just a something in the art world um but the funny thing that that school really didn't have a painting department they were uh you know they're just focused much more on on modern art and being part of the the kind of cultural conversation and i was definitely an old fart to be even attempting to participate in that a bunch of like 19 20 year olds yeah yeah, yeah. trying to make relevant art and um, and I appreciate that and I, you know, admire that, but it was not, I was trying to become a better painter. Um, but I did, uh, I only went for a year, um, and I did take some painting courses and some drawing classes that really did improve my skills because they were, uh, and I think I, I kind of was able to, um, connect with a couple of the professors who could see that that I was what I really wanted. Um, so they gave me the, the freedom to kind of really develop more as a painter. And, um, yeah, a couple of those press professors in particular just kind of helped me with some of the kind of technical aspects of, of, you know, the, the practice of painting. Um, but somewhere right in that period, my uh, commission or my my uh, illustration work started. Um, I started making enough money that I was like, "Well, okay, this is really hard to go to school and keep up with my commissions and be a parent to my <laughs> children." Uh, so I dropped out again, and and it kind of you know had become my full time job right at about that point. 
Oh, that's really cool. And and were you learning oil at the school? Because now you do mostly acrylic on wood, right? Yeah, I did both. Um, I was pushing pretty hard to try to to become an oil painter. Um, and I mean, those to me, they're not they're not particularly different uh, practices. You you just have less flexibility with uh, acrylic. You know, oil, you just have a lot of time and the paint is very, um, you're, you can manipulate it very easily. Um, acrylic, you, you know, you kind of have to make more solid choices and maybe it's a little more like drawing. Um, you know, you can be a little more ticky tacky with your details without having to wait for your layers of oil paint to, to dry. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, acrylic has really been driven purely out of time. You know, if I'm, uh, yeah, I try to, most of my commissions take anywhere from one to three days. And like once I start painting anyway, and that kind of, I just don't have the time to, to wait for a layer to dry to come back. So I put some acrylic paint down and put that in front of the space heater <laughs> and then keep going that's unreal how fast you are i mean it comes with the years right at first you 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 weren't that fast right no no yeah no so you work primarily in like layers then and kind of build them up is that typically what it looks like uh yeah yeah um i almost always do an underpainting um you know well i i start with a sketch i i work on these uh plywood panels and I'll, I'll put a coat of uh, like acrylic medium over that. And then I draw out the scene um, with pencil and just to, you know, make sure my composition is translating from the sketches I've done with the, with the client. Um, and then I'll usually just put a real thin layer on and that just starts, it, it kind of gets a lot of texture. Um, and some of the surprise of painting gets established at that point. Yeah. But also just more like my lights and shadows. And then, uh, yeah, I just build up from there. And sometimes it's only one more layer. Sometimes it's 10, you know, it, sometimes I'm feeling really bold and I can kind of do it all in one layer. And that, that's almost ideal to me because it feels like I'm. It's kind of like Ala Prima oil painting. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, and a lot of my favorite painters paint that way. You know, they have such a mastery of color that they just mix it up and apply it with really simple uh, marks and it looks unreal. Like and, Sargent? Yeah, yeah, Sargent. I, I think all the artists I love love Sargent for sure. Yeah. Um, but, but I think a lot of the modern greats are the same way they... Um, I'm forgetting the term for for it, but um, yeah, it's just where you're you're applying the final layer as your first mark. <laughs> it's something to always strive for. I think that's what's so cool about that stuff is like with with layers, it's like with enough calculation and deliberation, you can get close to what you want. And I'm speaking for myself, yeah. But to really get everything right with like those initial marks takes such true mastery that it's like you yep. always have that thing to go towards like and that's why yep. i love like uh frazetta's watercolors yeah. on top of just his oil paintings because you can yep. tell that there's that genius that's why i i just love the medium of watercolor too for yeah. that reason yeah yeah water watercolor you can't you can't screw up <laughs> yeah well, there's not that much room i feel you there Well, we covered a lot of stuff here. I'm trying to think <laughs> what, what else is on my mind here. Yeah. You might be hearing my three-year-old having a meltdown upstairs. So I, I thought that was a cat. That's a human? That's a human. He's, you know, maybe he's part cat. <laughs> he's, a, he's a tornado. He's, I don't know, three-year-olds. It's like the best of times and the worst of times. But he's, uh, sounds like he's having a hard time. <laughs> Are, are any of your kids like it, it, share your love of art or what's that kind of been like? Yeah, both, uh, both my older kids are quite skilled. 
Um, my daughter's going to school for animation, actually. Oh, awesome! So she's she's in an art program at uh, the University of Oregon, and then my son Alex is more. Um, he he likes real fine drawing, you know, very detail. But um, they both, you know, I think just growing up around me doing it all the time, and I was, I tried to keep them off screens as much as I could in their childhood too so drawing was a <laughs> a good pastime and they're both really good that's awesome Virgil Virgil's starting to get into it you know it's hard to know he's my my the young three-year-old yeah yeah he's hard to know what'll happen with that guy oh, of course yeah any other like uh you know painters that or just artists in general that are really inspiring to you now, or maybe even when you were kind of like growing up, like it seems like you have very wide taste, which is awesome. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I love all those, those mid century illustrators like Ralph McQuarrie and Frazetta and, um, you know, the, just that kind of golden era of illustration is, I think that was the stuff that really, influenced me initially and then you know like some of those like like polish illustrators of the 60s 70s 80s that got real weird and interesting like children's book illustrators that were were pretty wild and psychedelic mm -hmm. um but then as i started trying to get into painting i think i started getting more and more drawn into uh you know modern masters um Oh, you know, I'm sure all the metal painters love, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, Nicola Samori. I don't know if you know his work, but, uh, it's amazing. He's an oil painter. Um, uh, oh, I, I love, um, um, oh, geez. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean to put you on the spot. Oh, uh, uh Emilio, uh, Vialba, Vialba. He's, he's out of the Bay area. Um, he started doing, you know, he, he trained under Mark Tennant, who's one of the great modern figure painters. Um, but he, he started doing portraiture that would be really, you know, he'd kind of like screw them up and make them kind of off kilter and creepy. But he had this real foundation of being this, this masterful portrait. And it kind of deconstructs from there. Yeah. 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 And he's... He's become, you know, he's doing basically like expressionism now. Um, I think just his love of paint has taken him in a, in a whole different direction than his early work. But I love both periods. Um, That's also, I can kind of relate to that too. Like, uh, not me particularly, but if you look at somebody like Picasso, extremely... Um, technical and gifted, you know, for that era, and then deconstructs to like simplicity. And you kind of see that same kind of like journey where mm -hmm. once you get to a certain level, where else do you go? Well, you can explore, you know, pain as expression, kind of like you're talking about. So I, I think that's something maybe some people um, that aren't artists maybe don't get because they'll look at something that's like a really <laughs> simple Picasso and they're like, oh, I could have done that. Right. But you yeah. don't understand the journey that person took to be able to come up with that and the brilliance and some of the simplicity. Yeah. So, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. I often think that about Emilio's work that it was very brave for him to, cause he had, a, a, you know, I think he started having a lot of success with those more uh, portrait like paintings, but he just took, followed his, his heart and painted what he wanted to paint. And now he's doing, I mean, I think I imagine some people are like, Oh, I don't know if I like the modern stuff, but I think painters really appreciate that. He just had the, the cojones to do it. Yeah. I could be getting it mixed up, but I mean, he's been around for a long time, right? Like he was even making some paintings in like the seventies or am I getting it mixed up with somebody else? No, he's, he's younger than me. He's oh, okay. Uh, yeah. I'm totally a different person. Yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a modern guy, um, you know, probably in his late thirties, mid thirties, something like that. Oh, nice. 
so, I mean, you're obviously like a really optimistic person or at least positive, but like, what is maybe <laughs> the, well, at least, at least for what you're portraying here. No, but, um, what do you think is like maybe the, the worst part about being, you know, a, an artist nowadays, it's, especially, you know, your particular niche? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't feel like I can really complain about anything. Um, See what I'm talking about? <laughs> well, I I make art for a living. It's you know, it's like I have a dream job. So it's I I feel like if I whine too much, it sounds a little hollow. Right. But, um, you know, turning your passion into your job has some real downsides. Um, it you know, it becomes a job. Um, and you know, doing commission work, you are. Uh, the vast majority of my clients are, are super easy to work with. And um, I feel like I, I have developed the ability to really kind of understand what they're looking for and to give them that. But every once in a while you'll get a client who can't be pleased or, or it's almost like they don't know what they don't want until you've created it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's one of the most frustrating moments for me. Um, partially because I didn't deliver what they wanted, but also partially because I, I've tried very hard to head that off with a lot of, uh, you know, communication and, and sketching. And um, I give them a lot of progress shots and stuff. So, uh, yeah, just, you know, commission work can be a little soul sucking at times. Um, you know, I've worried over the years about, cause I feel like sometimes I'm going toe to toe with like, uh, digital artists. Yeah. And I mean, even some of my favorite modern painters are digital artists. I mean, it's not to denigrate that skill, but it does involve a lot of shortcuts compared to what I do. And that, there's always that little bit of a feeling of like, huh, is, is what I do going to be obsolete? at some point and you know now with ai imagery it's even a, a more kind of like huh what's what's gonna happen to this little world but i i don't i don't spend too much time worrying about it because I, I think people have always sought me out because i paint yeah i mean like, i mean i mean no one knows the answer to the effects of ai art completely but it also seems like the people who can do things by hand are a little bit separate maybe than the digital artists that are really competing with it. Yeah. So, and you can always sell your originals when you're handmade as well, which is only a portion of the revenue, but yeah, it is worth noting. Yeah. 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 And I, I also think, you know, there's that funny thing where I think if you were a band and you used an AI album cover, you'd get laughed off the stage. So you know, there's a, a level of authenticity that people still want. I mean, I think, I mean, digital art has been able to overcome that for some, you know, some genres and some, some people, but I do think at the heart of a lot of underground metal, people still want handmade art. And yeah. About that. I think a lot of it's just going to come down to costs. So, <laughs> you know, Maybe it won't affect the big bands, right? So let's just put out a hypothetical. Like if Metallica did an AI art, then they're going to get so much commentary. Now they get commentary and team, they do anything, right? right? But think about all the up and coming bands that maybe can't afford an artist yet. They yeah. would be the ones who do the AI. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that hobby level mm -hmm. is now kind of like, it's actually harder to kind of like get your roots going. So I do feel like yeah. maybe for it will affect the next generation of artists in the sense that those like really like hobby level kind of jobs maybe are going to be taken away by AR so they can't get their foundations going. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I feel bad for those bands that might make that choice when they could have <laughs> even a crappy hand drawn <laughs> album cover. Yeah. Kind no, of, I, and I'm with you. Kind of a cheesy move. I mean, some of the AI imagery is really cool looking. I, I don't, you know, I'm not saying that. And some people 
I don't know. It's like people with with recording who who prefer analog recordings versus digital recordings. I mean, that debate went on forever, and I think I'm a little bit of a, a Luddite with a lot of that stuff. But um, there is just this authenticity with having to work harder at stuff that I sure appreciate, and, and I think a lot of people do. Yeah. But if if that's not for you, then, you know, do your thing. <laughs> no, I, I'm with you. Um, what are maybe some, like, lessons you've learned in regards to the business side of art, then? We've probably touched on a couple, but can you think of anything else? Um, you know, uh, yeah. I, I've learned to kind of be confident in my pricing, you know, I tried to be very affordable for a long time and, and you never know. I mean, I, I'm sure any other, I mean, you, you probably share the same feeling. You never really know where you're landing when you give someone a price or the, whether they're going to be like, Oh, that's great. Or if they're going to be like, well, geez, that's insane. <laughs> and, um, I used to really fret about that a lot, but, um, I felt like I kind of found a sweet spot where I was, and I think it's part of the reason <laughs> you see a lot of my art out there where I just wasn't too out of range for a lot of bands, but it paid me enough to do what I do as long as I'd stayed pretty productive. Um, so I think finding that sweet spot, don't get a big head, you know, <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm all for artists making good money when they can and you know i i would love for that day to come for me no um, i i think you know you have these opportunities where a job pays more or where one of your originals sells for for a lot more than they typically do but um i don't know i don't i just think it's like if you stay really productive uh, that's almost the most important thing um yeah hmm i don't know I've, I've gotten a little better at standing my ground with clients if we have a conflict and, and i mean it's very rare but um i can kind of start getting a sense where it's like oh it's them it's not me you know it's yeah like this person can't be satisfied or they just don't know what they want um so you know stick with your gut as as a creator and um remember that you're the painter <laughs> not them and i mean i say this as someone who really tries to deliver what people are asking for but um there are times when i have to just be like i think your judgment is is not correct here <laughs> yeah yeah when i was talking with uh brad moore he was saying something kind of similar He's saying sometimes the client and he's already had a really good working relationship with them and they're kind of adamant about like a change or a slight edit. And at first he's maybe just a little hesitant, but then he's like, you know what? They were actually right. And then sometimes it's the other way around. And that yeah. takes a lot of humility, which when I heard him say that, I thought that was really, really cool. Yeah. I have absolutely had that happen several times where, you know, the thing I'm annoyed at proved to be the, the correct direction um yeah yeah Br brad's a great guy he's actually um when i was just desperately trying to get established as an illustrator he was a real um you know positive voice for me telling me i, I he thought i'd make it and all this and <laughs> it was i i really appreciated it i i can't i can't say enough uh nice things about him and I haven't even really known him that long, but um, he's become a friend, so it's really nice. It's great. What you want to pop some of these uh, pieces up, and you can kind of talk to him a little bit. Sure. Sweet. All right. So this first one is the uh, "Unleash the Archers" cover from their last album, which I'm actually forgetting the name of, but I think it's it's excellent. I, I really love the the sound of this album and I'm not even really a big power metal fan, but it's one where like me and my wife can definitely like jam it, you know, <laughs> in the car and it, it's good driving music. Yeah. Um, but man, this is such a beautiful painting. I, you want to talk a little bit about it? Oh, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, uh, you know, they, I mean, it's been a little bit since I painted it, but um, I remember they, they wanted just a very kind of lush scene. Um, you know, I think the, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, the, the woman who's kind of hovering in the center of the front cover, mm -hmm. sort of a, an evil force and we have the hero in our, in our foreground. Um, yeah, I, you know, I mean, it definitely features a lot of my, <laughs> my go to go to imagery. Um, but, uh, I, this is definitely one where I got really lost in the details and, and, you know, it's a fun thing about painting these vast landscapes. You can just kind of, keep going and going and going with them. Then same with the space stuff and, and space is really forgiving. You know, you can do almost anything and it looks cool if you kind of make it look luminous and stuff. So. Mm -hmm. Those uh, kind of figures behind that woman in the center, are they almost like kind of like little after images of her or are they like other people in your mind? Um, they kind of have a similar, um, you know, shape to them. Yeah. Um, I believe they're supposed to be her, you know, kind of consorts like her, uh, her minions, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, you know, they just wanted some sort of like spectral bloaty guys. Uh, it's funny. I kind of have characters like that in paintings. Mm -hmm. I used to do more watercolor. Uh, you know, that is really fun to, to create those kind of drippy, skeletal figures and do you, do you uh, remember some of the references that you pulled for this one or did was a lot of it off your imagination um i don't remember specifics i probably had to look at some you know the figures how they're positioned you know i, I would say figure drawing is not my strong suit yeah you know i i uh I've tried over the years to, to get better at it and um, I'm definitely better than I used to be, but it's just, it's so challenging and it's not like my focus that I, I don't think I've ever achieved mastery there. <laughs> um, so I was probably looking at some, some references just to get their, their kind of positioning. Um, I was probably looking at, you know, some, some nebula art or, or photos or, um, some Milky Way photos for the space scenes. Yeah. Th those mountains and the canyon definitely look a little more like my kind of freewheeling, just kind of, I'll just kind of put a whole bunch of marks down and then start constructing things out of them. And that, that's kind of what that looks like to me. Very cool. And are there like areas of the painting that have more layers than others, like by a lot, or is it pretty uniform across um i would imagine the landscape and and the figures have more than the space scene uh just because i space is you know like i said it's a little more forgiving and you want in a lot of cases you don't want these hard edges and stuff so mm -hmm. and you know space is pretty abstract <laughs> You don't have to be so precise, except when you're painting. Actually, I remember those ellipses, the, the uh, rings of the planet, those took forever because I was just freehanding them. And oh, yeah. Freehanded ellipses are they're hard. <laughs> totally. Oh, that's cool. With uh, your technique, then, and this might be a, a dumb question because I've never worked like a really, I, I don't do acrylic painting at all. But like, can you do any like wet on wet techniques where you put down a little bit of water and let the paint kind of spread a little bit, or is it really not work kind of like watercolor in that way? Uh, not too much like that. I mean, you can add as much water to acrylic as you want to get mm -hmm. it to do that, um, but it doesn't tend to behave like watercolor because the paper, you know, kind of right. You can't just put water on the wood and expect it to function like paper right but but one thing i will do is uh, put just load up my paintbrush with a lot of um a lot of different pigment and then 
you know, th that is, it's closer to oil painting really where you, your marks become, you know, they're even accidental marks become your final marks because you just like what happened. Mm. That's something I'm doing all the time in the paintings, unless I'm doing something like a, a figure. But I mean, even in the figure sometimes, um, because it's, it's almost like the detail looks better when it's accidental than if I'm trying too hard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You definitely don't want to like overwork it. And sometimes you just have it right. You know, that first or second time. Yeah. Overworking it is my fatal flaw for sure. Yeah. Uh, likewise too, especially with watercolor. Um, so that's interesting. So obviously you do some, you know, mixing of the palette, um, you know, just on that, the palette itself, but you're doing a little bit of that just kind of live with the strokes. Cause there's different pigments throughout the brush. Like what, what size brush are you? I mean, I imagine you, you go through different sizes as you go for the details and stuff, but like, is there kind of like a brush that you do a majority of it with in terms of size? Oh yeah. I have, I almost have three brushes that, I mean, I have a ton of brushes that are kind of out and ready to be used, but it almost always comes down to the same three. And, uh, you know, one is probably, uh, well, I'll, I'm just sitting in my studio. I'll show you. Um, I'm going to pull you up. That's cool. <laughs> I got to remove that. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, those are the three I use the most. Um, and it almost goes in an order of operations, like the the big fat one um, is how I start paintings, and uh, then so I so it's start... a round and then a square and then that like tapered shape yeah. one. What's that? Is what's what's the name of those? I, I forget. Um, <laughs> I have no idea. Um, let's see. This one's a a Princeton uh, poly tip bristle and three quarter inch. The Princeton Catalyst. It's a. Uh, I don't know. They're kind of hard to track down these days, but I, I just like because they they will make some pretty nice hard edges. Mm, yeah. Um, and then sometimes I use them, and I'm doing a lot of scrubbing, and uh, you know mixing with them, so I kind of wear them down to these blunt nubs eventually. But uh, when they're new and and crisp, it's it's a really a nice. Oh yeah, you can tell. <laughs> yeah, and then you know the more kind of intermediate. This is this is one's random. I actually really like um, like hog bristle brushes, but this one is some kind of synthetic. Um, but that one is good for honing in, but not getting too too picky. And then yeah, the rounds. It's funny. I use the new rounds when they're really pointy for my. Mm -hmm my finest detail, but I inevitably start fucking up those brushes as I'm going. And so I'll use those as kind of an inter the kind of screwed up ones as like an intermediate, you know, sort of detail. <laughs> so I, I know what you mean though. You kind of like, I'm like working with some, uh, you know, like nice ish Windsor Newtons. And I'm like, man, I'm really like beating down on this palette. I probably should not be doing that right now, but yep. you get caught in the moment. You know? Yep. Yeah. I, yeah. Same deal. I, I try not to just blast through my brushes, but yeah, I, I, and some of that's related to back when I was younger and paint was something I could barely afford and new brushes were something I could barely afford. So I, I really would kick myself for not taking better care of it. But, um, you know, now I consider it a cost of, of what I do. So it's not yeah. quite, quite so urgent so we have two here somewhat strategically placed because they um have shared members in the past <laughs> we have uh gate creeper here sonoran deprivation i believe and then uh this is spirit of drifts album i don't remember the name of it but I do know a little factoid about the Spirit of Drift one. I'm curious to see if you'll point it out. Um, but just so you're aware, like the uh, the Gate Creeper cover, that's the first one I ever saw from you. Oh, wow. Uh -huh. Yeah. So that was kind of my introduction. Um, but yeah, it, 
You got any uh, points on these two? Um, well, the Gate Creeper one was was pretty fun. Uh, they were easy to work with. Um, I think it was an example of uh, kind of one of my earlier death metal covers where I was like, huh, you know, the my style seems to appeal to this band, and I and it was a little surprising to me. Yeah, um, and that that was it was you know kind of fortuitous i think um but really they they kind of let me do my own thing i mean i remember um they wanted it to to be a, a desert scene um and you know this sort of calamitous nature thing is happening i think i was really looking at a lot of uh, john martin paintings uh, which is i is always kind of not far from my mind um cuz he does these sort of He'll do these like depictions of big natural disasters or or hmm. you know religious events that are. I mean, they're massive, massive paintings. Um, but uh, I mean, he's he's like late eighteen hundreds. Um, he's his landscapes are always kind of on my mind. Um, and then I remember, uh, you know, here's the death metal touch at the end. They were like, "Oh, can you put some skulls in there?" <laughs> <laughs> okay sure <laughs> it's pretty subtle though it's yeah cool. it didn't have skulls to begin with but they i think they were just like oh we got to make it more death metal <laughs> i think like the camera position on that cover is super cool how it's like going up at like uh you know a diagonal and you see like more of the sky uh-huh. like that was that was really neat like were you thinking of that like right from the beginning like you wanted to have that kind of interesting you know perspective and stuff or like how Uh, did that kind of come uh that's always like when i do a a landscape that um consideration of whether it's more sky or more ground is always kind of one of the first things i've got to figure out right um and then you know there's this kind of compositional uh rule of thumb where you want to split things into thirds so it um I, i don't always land there but i always have that in my mind i mean you can even see from the spirit adrift painting that kind of green field in the background is sitting right at a third and the mountains are at the yeah very good point it's kind of a i think landscape photography and and landscape painters kind of use that rule of thumb just for composition but uh oh that uh actually the um uh there's a funny story around that painting where um, another illustrator. So I'm trying to remember the the label. Oh, my wife's here. What do you need? has a rash that came upon suddenly. I'm very nervous about it. I'm on the line with the advice nurse. Okay. So. Okay. Uh, it sounds like I'm yet again having a child emergency. Um, yeah, you need a hop. <laughs> well, um, I don't know. Maybe if we can wind this down, that would be. Yeah, let's cool. do that. Let's sorry about like that. five minutes. Okay, perfect. Speed round. Yes. Um, well, anyway, there was another artist who had a painting uh, very similar to the Gate Creeper one, and uh, I'm trying to remember whose label it was. It's this Portland label. Um, but anyway, that put out the skate, the gate creeper one, they made a meme that was pretty mean spirited toward this other guy's art. And, uh, it kind of made the rounds on the internet for a minute. And, um, I mean, he's another pretty prominent, uh, Andre, he's another pretty prominent illustrator, but, um, he and I like spoke kind of behind the scenes and he was like telling me, they basically were implying that he copied my, painting right he had finished his months before i finished mine and i had never seen his painting so it was just uh you know what do they call that like divergent evolution where two things develop on a different path pure coincidence and uh yeah (laughs) just people making drama when you guys are just like on the sidelines like oh we're cool yep yep exactly so with the spirit of drift one Mm -hmm. if i'm not mistaken 
uh, those dogs, aren't they uh, Nate's actual dogs? That's his name, right? The, the front man? Yeah. 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 And I believe one of them had just passed away. So this was a little tribute to that one. Um, yeah. Yeah. That was, those are, those are pretty much portraits of their dogs. You know, he gave me a whole bunch of uh, um, reference photos to work from. Yeah, I love that painting. I imagine that one was was a bit trickier too. Oh boy, yeah, he's easily one of the most challenging paintings I've ever made. Um, just because it's it's moving figures, you know, that's yeah. that's as hard as it gets. And yeah, I mean, I, that one, I, uh, I mean, I I love that painting, and I had a lot of fun, but I definitely have a lot of technical issues with my own skills on that one. But that's just. I'm that way with all my figure painting, really. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I think when it's on a tiny screen like this, it looks great. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't want it right in your face, huh? Yeah, yeah. I know it is. How well, about this? Because since you got to hop, I won't, you know, yeah, you don't need I'm to go sorry. through all of them. Oh, it's totally fine. But, hey, um, anybody who's tuning in, uh, obviously, Adam, super grateful for your time and – you know, you've shared some wisdom along the way too, and you're just a super down to earth person. I really, really respect that. Um, for anybody who's obviously still tuned in, please, you know, like and subscribe uh, to the channel. It's starting to grow, starting to get more artists, and it's it's been really, really fun for me, and I hope it's been for you guys. Um, last question for you, Adam, and then you're you're good to go. Um, any like advice for someone trying to get into the metal or album art kind of scene right now what would you have for them um i would you know i think creating a ton of work is the best thing you can do for yourself and uh and just to get established i mean you uh i had this this drive to become better um, just because i i tried to be really honest with myself about my skill levels and, um, you know, kind of trying to go all in on it like that. I was like, well, I have to be really good if I'm going to have any success at this. Um, so just working super hard at your skill building. And, and honestly, I mean, classes really do help. If you find some good teachers, um, that can be a really helpful. But there's nothing more helpful than just doing it as often as you can. You know, just crank out tons of work and study it um you know study artists that you admire um you know and there's no no shame in copying their work to gain the skills uh you probably don't want to then put your name on it and, <laughs> and say it's yours <laughs> say yeah. it's yours it's like but, doing cover songs as right exactly you learn right. through it yes exactly um so you know be as prolific as you possibly can um Early on, I just approached a lot of bands, you know, I, I would just send them an email. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I mean, the internet has, and social media has truly blown out of proportion since those days for me. So it might be a little harder to approach people that way. But um, I think, oh, you know, honestly, uh, I think one of the big things for me that worked was... Um, I kind of kept going when it didn't make any sense to keep going. You know, I, I didn't have most of the people in my life were kind of like, well, I don't know if this is a so good to throw all your eggs in this one basket. And, but I do think if you can kind of outlast people just through sheer persistence and volume of work, that that really is a, a, that is a recipe for, you know, you, your work will be out there. Right. And you can, and there's just a, this point where all that effort starts coming back and, you know, it's all in all these little ways, but, um, yeah, work a lot, <laughs> <laughs> work hard youngsters. That's no, I love that. My advice. Well, thank you again so much, Adam. Uh, just keep in touch every once in a while. And, um, I'll, I'll let you know when we're going to be posting this. Okay. That sounds great. Thanks so much, Lee. Yeah, best luck with everything. Thanks. Bye. Bye.